interpretation of that since I come from Italy and I'm not used to the dark, especially in the summer, so the projector turned to be sunny and yellowish. So I, ha I hope I will handle even if he doesn't turn uh, um, white. So that's the plan of my lectures as, I, as we saw together. Um, I think last time I went a little bit uh, more slowly than I planned, which is good because otherwise I would be too fast, right? So let me revise a little bit the plan. So let me move the how to store big graphs to the end. So in case we don't make it there, you can look at the slide. That's a very important issue, right? Uh, because web graphs are really huge. And there is this uh, web graph uh, framework by Boldi and Vigna, which is able to store web graphs with three bits per link. Well, that's great, right? Think about it. If you have a graph with, uh, let's say, four billion edges, right? Uh, four billion edges means that uh, uh, Basically, you can uh, address nodes with 32 bits, right? You will have two to the 32 nodes, right? So you need 32 bits per node. And that means that you need uh, 64 bits per edge, right? So web graph uses three roughly three bits on average per edge. I mean, that's quite remarkable, right? So that's a gain of more than 20, which means that you know a graph with four billion edges will fit into main memory, right? And if you, if you don't use this compression, will not. So we'll have all these external memory problems. As, as Lars said, I mean, uh, external memory can be quite an issue, especially for graphs, right? Because for graphs, you have a lot of pointer jumping. You need basically random access, right? So each operation will be an I.O. basically, right? OK. Um, and what's that graph to the left? So let me just uh, do a quick uh, come back to two-edge connectivity and two-edge connected components. So what are the two-edge connected components of that graph? Or more simply, what are the strong bridges of this graph? Can you see any strong bridge? Uh, that's a strong bridge, right? Let me do it this way. Right? Because if I delete this edge, then there are only edges getting out of this. And this guy gets kicked out of the strongly connected component, right? And when you delete this guy, then this becomes a strong bridge, right? It was not before a strong bridge, right? But now it becomes a strong bridge. And when you delete this guy, then this becomes a strong bridge, right? And when you delete this guy, then this becomes a strong bridge, right? So somehow it's, and uh, so on and so forth, right? Okay, so which means that you, to discover the two edge connected components, you have to apply several times the algorithm to find the strong bridges, right? Order of n in this case, right? So the question is, can you discover all kind of recursively strong bridges in one shot without doing all this onion peeling, right? Somehow. So that's the main question. Okay? OK, so yeah. No, so that was something I mentioned, something that I'm trying to work on. And if you're interested, you know, uh, we can talk about this. Yeah. Sorry? The light to Oh, and um, maybe I don't know how to do that. There should be a switch some, some place, right? But yeah, but they.
the red ones, okay. <laughs> there, there is no lamps here. Yeah, so it's easy. There is no light. Uh, but you see it better? Okay. Okay, good. Uh, can we keep the light on or shall I? Okay, good. So I'll feel more home. Uh, all right. So I'll, I'll, in the first hour, we'll talk about four degrees of separation uh, and the diameter. It's a very nice problem uh, in which I think there is a lot of work to be done yet. And then I will talk about memory errors. Uh, so I'll try to talk about things uh, that people are working on these days and things where I think some progress is needed. So just to attract you to work on these issues. OK. So you probably heard about four degrees of separation. Uh, there was a story. Oh, quite. OK, thank you. There was a story back in. Uh, 29 called chains uh, suggested that any two persons in the world are at most uh, six friends apart, right? And uh, somehow this is uh, kind of a uh, trivial consequence of uh, combinatorial explosion, right? So if I have, I have uh, 200 friends, and if all my friends have 200 friends, this is uh, this ball of uh, friendship is kind of exploding combinatorially, right? The point is that there are triangles, right? Somehow, and that's uh, like limiting the amount of combinatorial explosion. So this is basically saying, uh, despite there are many triangles in friendships or you know in acquaintances, still there is a combinatorial explosion. So it's a small world. If you pick two random persons in the world, they are not very far apart. So maybe you are, you know, six uh, friends far apart from Berlusconi or from your favorite uh, man in, uh, you know, whatever. I'm more than six, luckily. Uh, so this is, has been studied a lot in sociology, right? And uh, there was an, es a, a, an experiment done, done by Milgram. Uh, that wanted to answer to that question. So take two random persons in your population. Uh, what's, what's the probability that they are zero apart, meaning they're friends, one apart, so they have one friend in, in the middle, and so on and so forth. The slides are on the website, right? So you, sh you can look at them. Um, so note that somehow uh, Milgram, I mean, as computer scientists, we measure distance, right? So if I'm friend with him, our distance is one, right? For social sociologists, it's zero, because there is no, no one in between, right? So it's just uh, that we have to uh, think about this. So when you think about degrees of separation, it's distance minus one, OK? or somehow the distance is the degree of separation plus one. Um, so what did Milgram do? He selected uh, about 300 people, 296, and uh, they were selected this way. So 100 of them were random Boston uh, people from Boston. 100 were random Nebraska stockholders. And 96 were random people in Nebraska. And he gave an envelope to each of them. And he said, look, the final destination for this envelope is a person in Boston who is a stockholder, right? So we expect that uh, you know, uh, these three groups have different ways to get to the destination, right? If you are in Boston, then probably you are closer to the target. If you're a stockholder, same job, then probably closer to the target. And the rule of the game is that uh, you got this envelope, you knew the destination address, and you were supposed to only send it to someone that would know personally by first name. OK? 
okay? And uh, so that's one, uh, uh, you know, that's taken from uh, Milgram's paper. It's one trip of, of one envelope flow started from uh, uh, um, Nebraska and arrived to Boston uh, following all those moves, right? Um, so some letters got, uh, um, didn't reach destination, uh, 64 of them did, and uh, it measured the average distance uh, that was uh, 6.2. Uh, uh, it was actually, you know, 5.4 for people in Boston that were close to the destination, and 6.7 for the group that was far farther away from the destination, the random Nebraska people. Okay, so the distance was uh, 6.7. So Milgram concluded, you know, there are actually six degrees of separation. So actually, the uh, play w was right. Okay. Uh, what we'll talk about today is uh, experiments to reproduce these on uh, much bigger graphs. Okay. Uh, if you think about it, that experiment involved only very few people, right? Uh, is it the same also on the huge graph we have now today, like Facebook friendship graph? Um, so let me remind you some definition that you probably know already, just to have a common language. Uh, the distance is the length of the shortest path, right? And if you think about the Facebook graph, it's an underrated graph, and it's unweighted, right? So in that case, it's just the number of hope. So it, we assume the distance is infinity if there is no path between x and y. Uh, we define in, uh, 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 Thursday, uh, the distance distribution, uh, that is, we want to count uh, the number of pairs which are a distance t for each t. And uh, we're interested in the fraction of pairs at distance t, okay? So somehow the density function of the distribution. So there were a few experiments, like uh, Leskovec and Orwitz, show that you know in a quite large graph, billion arcs, uh, there were 6.6 .6 degrees of separation. That was one month uh, uh, Microsoft Messenger communication graph. Uh, someone analyzed the Twitter graphs and showed that there the degrees of separation are much smaller, 3.67. I mean, Twitter, I'm not sure it's a good example, right? Because uh, if she has a Twitter account, I can follow her and I don't need her permit to follow her, right? So it's not kind of a friendship, right? It's not an acquaintance. So I'm not sure degrees of separation make any sense on Twitter. Uh, but anyway, and then I, I'll be talking about this experiment uh, that made it even to the New York Times. So they measured the degrees of separation in Facebook. Uh, so the experiment by Backstrom et al. Uh, it's a huge graph, billion of, you know, almost one billion uh, nodes and 69 billion links, right? Uh, how do they do it? It's a huge graph, right? Well, the, the ingredients are web graph. You compress the graph so that you get three bits per link. And uh, then uh, it used uh, uh, an, approxima an appro approximation to the neighborhood function. And uh, it used uh, probabilistic counters to measure uh, kind of the distribution function. So we'll see some of the details uh, and, um, and stop me if, if you have any question. I, I will not go in to, into the low level details about probabilistic counting. I think you will see some uh, probabilistic counting methods with Alex on Wednesday, so we'll give you more details about some of the methods. So the heart of the problem is to compute the neighborhood function. So uh, for each t, we want the number of pairs at distance no more than t, right? 
and uh, somehow it, this gives information on uh, how fast the average ball expands around the vertex, around the node. Uh, how, do how can we compute the neighborhood function? Uh, well, the trivial approach would be do all the breadth-first search visits, right? If I start with breadth-first search from a node, I'm computing basically the ball of all the ball of neighbors, all the levels around this node, right? But that's expensive. It's m times n. So we won't be able to compute this on huge graphs, right? Or, you know, you could sample and you could say, OK, I'm not doing all the possible BFS. I'll just do a random number of BFS. Uh, but then uh, you have still few problems, because if the graph is not, for instance, if it's directed, but it's not strongly connected, well, if you start from the wrong part of the graph, then your, D, your BFS doesn't make any sense, right? So remember the, like the bow tie structure of web graphs? If I pick a node which is actually not able to reach the giant strongly connected component, it's BFS, it's not really giving me much information, OK? Um, there is a very nice approach by Edith Cohen, uh, uh, which is basically giving you the, some kind of size estimation of the descendants of a node. Um, it's a very powerful technique. It gives you very good theoretical guarantees. But unfortunately, it doesn't scale really well on huge graphs. So you cannot really apply on graphs with billion edges. Actually, Andrew Goldberg told me that uh, there, are, there are new results about this approach. And so maybe they can prove that you can actually have this approach scaled down to very big graphs, OK? Um, so an alternative m way to compute the neighborhood function is uh, this diffusion method, with, which is due to Palmer et al. Um, so take the ball of radius t around node x, right? How can you get the ball of radius t plus 1? out of x. How can you extend this ball one step? Well, you can take all the balls of radius t of the neighbors of x, right? Union them together, and then we'll, this will give you the ball of radius t plus 1 around x, right? So basically, you have to compute that equation, and you start from the uh, initial condition that the ball of radius 0 around x is just x, right? Uh, so the neighbor function is given by the sum of the size of the balls of radius t. OK? So that's the number of pairs which are a distance t is given by all those sums of the, of the cardinalities, right? So basically, to compute this thing, you can just uh, um, scan all the edges and do that kind of uh, com computation on the, on the balls. Around nodes, yeah. No, so the ball is the the definition of ball is the nodes at distance at most t. Okay. So you are actually accounting for distances. It, so we'll see. We'll, we'll, I'll give you the details. It's a, it's a funny sum somehow. You have to um, take into account that you can uh, have. Uh, it's, there are multisets somehow, right? And you have to take into account that there are multisets. Okay, but I'll get into the details. Just, that's just a rough idea, okay? Other questions? Uh, I think both, right? So if it's a directed graph, then you're talking about directed path and distance from x to y. 
and you're talking about directed edges. Okay? And it should be the same, right? Okay. Uh, so this method of computing uh, the neighbor function through diffusion is very easy, but it's uh, very expensive. So for each node, you have to maintain a ball. So it means you have to maintain n bits, right? While you're computing this ball. And this gives you basically n square bits that you have to carry around while your algorithm is, is executing. And that's way too much. You cannot afford to have space n square, right? We cannot deal with big graphs. Uh, all, uh, what we need is actually estimating the cardinality. So estimating the number of different elements in uh, very large multisets. I hope this makes clear your question, right? It's a multiset, so you, you don't want to count the same node twice, right? Um, so basically what happens is if you go through this uh, diffusion method, when you, your balls are, are growing in the graph, uh, it means that you have uh, basically uh, a very large multiset uh, where the same item may appear more than once. And basically, these multisets come to you as a stream, right? Because when a ball is growing, you get more and more nodes. And, uh, and when this multiset is, 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 is uh, growing as a stream, you want to estimate the number of, of distinct elements in the multiset. You want to estimate the cardinality of the multiset. OK? Do you agree? That's basically the process that you uh, are doing. Um, and uh, the idea about uh, uh, this by, by Palmer, A and F, was not to compute the cardinality exactly, but to approximate it. That's why it's called ANF, approximate neighbor function, neighborhood function. Okay? And uh, somehow, when you take the basic, basic steps here, you have two union sets, right? When you're unioning both. So you want to compute quickly uh, and update quickly uh, uh, the cardinality as sets get union. That's what we want to do. OK, so let me now get into some more low-level details. And let me tell you a little bit the difference between A and F. First, you have questions about this? It's important that you understand. So there are balls growing in the graph, and uh, you're using them to compute the neighbor function. Basically, it boils down to having a stream of nodes that gives you a multiset. And you want to estimate the cardinality, number of different items in this multiset. OK? And you do it in an approximate way. Because doing it exactly would be too costly. That's what, what you're doing. Uh, is it clear? OK. So to do this, A and F use this uh, uh, diffusion process where the balls are growing, and use uh, Martin Flageolet counters to have a, an estimate on the cardinality. OK, that's just a method of doing probabilistic counting. And what uh, Boldy et al. did with hyper A and F is to use uh, some different probabilistic counters called hyper log log. And we'll see how they're called hyper log. I mean, you use this probabilistic counter to get a cardinality estimate as the, as the multiset is growing, right? And then they use some other quicks, some other you know, low-level tricks to compute those, uh, combine those counters quickly as you need to union multisets. OK? So let me get into the low-level details of uh, hyper-log-log counters, and you will understand what they're called log, where the log-log comes from. OK? Um, so I have many items coming. In our application, there are many nodes. And uh, basically, I want to keep 
a small counter that is some, give me some information about uh, of the cardinality of this multiset. So the number of distinct elements that are arriving. Okay? So I'm using uh, uh, a collection of uh, M, small M registers. M is not the number of edges. It's just, uh, so you can think like, uh, for instance, M is uh, 64, right? So for each node, I'm using 64 different registers. And it will, clear, and it will be clear in a second why I need to use different registers. Um, when a new item comes to the multiset, I compute a hash function of this item, okay? So the only property I need with this hash function is that uh, uh, the ith uh, bit is uh, zero, 1 with uh, probability one half, okay? So not, I don't need very, just a good hash function. Um, so I take the first uh, B bits of the hash function, and I use those B bits to check which one of the registers, which one of the counters I'm going to use it. OK? So the first B bits, uh, bits is, uh, B is uh, logarithmic in the number of registers. I use it to address one of the registers, OK? And then I use the remaining bits. I can assume even that this uh, hash function has, uh, gives me an infinite number of bits, OK? Just for the sake of argument. Uh, so I take the remaining bits. So the first B bits, I compute the, the address of the register. The remaining bits, uh, uh, OK, let, let's define row of S given a string S, a binary string S, as the position of the leftmost one bit. For instance, if you have 0, 0, 0, 1, then row of this string would be 4. Because, so it's kind of the uh, length of the leading trail of zeros plus 1, right? So I compute uh, basically row of the remaining bits, so where the first 0 appears, and, uh, and then I take, uh, I update the register J by that uh, formula. So if rho of W is more than the current maximum, the value of the register, it will be uh, the new value of the register, okay? I'll give you an intuition why this works, okay? First, you have question on, on the algorithm. So basically the idea is for each node, I keep M different counters. Each counter has, has very few bits. And uh, as we will see in the next slide, gives me an indication of the cardinality somehow. So let's try to get uh, some intuition of why this method works. Um, so I have many items coming into my multiset M. And let X be the cardinality of M. I don't know what the cardinality is, right? That's what I want to maintain. Uh, basically, I have m different registers, right? That is, I have one stream of data coming to me, and I divide it into m different streams, right? But just taking the first b bits of the hash function, right? So assume they are even, evenly divided, right? Uniformly divided. So this means that each substream will contain approximately x over m different elements, right? You agree? So a string comes. I divided this stream in m different channels. Just say you go here, you go there, you go to the other channel. And channels are selected by the first b bits of the hash function, right? So they are uniformly distributing somehow nodes to the different channels, OK? So each channel will contain x over m, approximately, different items, right? So the max parameter 
should be close to log of x over m, right? Because the max parameter is the uh, first one bit, right, that I get. I mean, if I get n random numbers, the maximum one will be log of n, right? In the position log n, right? You agree with that? If I get n, n different numbers and the bits can be 0, 1 with probability 1 half, then the maximum, the highest one bit will be log n, right? Okay? So basically each register is counting just where is the highest one bit and that gives you uh, something which is close to log of x over m. Okay. Uh, to compute the cardinality, the algorithm computes that funny formula, which is an harmonic mean of the quantity two to the max. Okay. Max should be close to log of x over m, so two to the max should be close. Uh, the, uh, to the max should be close to, I mean, the harmonic mean should be close to x over m. Okay? And the harmonic mean is uh, m times uh, zeta. So that's kind of a, an estimator of x over m. So m times zeta should be of the order of x, which is the unknown cardinality that I want to estimate. Okay? So there is a small constant alpha sub m which takes into account some uh, bias, okay? But forget about the constants. The idea is that I have a big stream, multi-set, many uh, items coming. I can have uh, replicas of the same item. I want to count the cardinality. So I take this stream, I divide it uniformly in m substreams. And for each substream, I keep the um, first one bit. So that's an estimator of log x over m, and then I adjust things so, so that I get uh, a nice estimation of x. Yeah? Yeah, so the harmonic pin is kind of smoothering that. Yeah, so it's kind of smoothering that effect. Okay? I mean, there are lots of details I won't go through. It's just a high level idea why it works. So basically, my problem is I have a huge multi set coming as a stream because these balls are, are growing. I want to know just the cardinality because that's what I need for the neighbor function. And I do it this way. This is kind of probabilistic counting. Okay? Any other questions? I mean, if you want to grab the low-level details, you can read the paper by Flagellet et al. Okay. Hmm? Uh, well, you should have many, enough substreams to smooth out, uh, you know, uh, uh, irregularities. So, for instance, for us, B should be at least four. Okay, but depends very much on your problem. Should, I mean, should be at least some, uh, it's for, depends on the application somehow. That gives you the number of substreams, and the number of substreams are actually smoothing things down. Because if you take only one register, then you can make mistakes, right? So it depends on the kind of uh, uh, quality you want to get. Okay? Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. So it depends very much on the quality of your solution because you can be, you know, you can have some variance and so you want to minimize the variance or whatever, okay? Um, Okay, so let's try to go on. 
So rather than uh, counting what we're doing, we are observing a statistical feature of the set. Okay? Uh, the feature is actually the number of trailing zeros coming out of a hash function. That's what we are serving. And we want to keep track of the maximum. Okay? So that means that we only need the log log n bits. Okay? Right? Because the maximum will be log of the of the counter somehow, okay? And uh, so the number of distinct elements will go like uh, two to the max. So will be, we need only log n bits for that. And, uh, and one, when you have two different streams, A and B, and you union them, then basically you have to compute the maximum of the counters, right? You have to take the counters and compute the maximum. That's what you have to do. Okay, uh, but basically with 40, if you make some uh, computation with 40 bits, you can count up to 4 billion with a standard deviation of 6%. Okay, so choosing B as an effect on the standard deviation, for instance. Okay, so let's get uh, back to our problems the, you know, balls in the graph. Uh, well, if you want to increase your confidence, then you need uh, several counters. So for instance, uh, uh, you need at least uh, 16 counters, okay? For the size of our uh, graphs. Uh, each set will be just a list of small counters, the registers, right? How small are these, those counters? Um, well, um, they are log log n, right? So if we have uh, like one gigagraphs, that's five. So you can have five bit counters. Um, you know, for really huge graphs, like 100 of giga, then probably you need seven bit counters, right? But with, you know, the graphs that we work on today, like it's difficult to get uh, more than 100 giga edges. So set seven bits should be okay. So all those counters should be at most seven bits, okay? Uh, to compute the union of two sets when you are enlarging your balls, so you're taking your union in the balls of the neighbors, then you have to take the maximum of all the count, of two counters, okay? And uh, you don't want to do those things uh, by taking bits, with taking out with bits, comparing and putting back, right? And so what I'll be showing you now is uh, a way to do that efficiently. Uh, somehow, um, the, the probabilistic counting used by A and F were just uh, simply, uh, union was mainly bit ors, so it was easy to do, right? Here, we are using counters which are, require less space, exponentially less space, log, log log n, rather than log n by Martin, Fla Martin Flagellier counters. But what we, that's what we gain, but what we lose is that unions are more complicated. It's not just oring bits, it's just computing, comparing and computing the maximum, okay? Let me show you, without getting into details, how can you do that uh, efficiently. You have questions? I, I didn't get into the low-level details, but I just gave you a rough idea. You have questions? Okay. So that's it. I have, uh, let's say, two nodes. And each node has many counters, right? So for instance, uh, I'm showing only four counters, right? But let's say each node has 16 counters, right? So the first counter is 9, 0, 3, 2. That's the first node. The second node has counters 7, 3, 3, and 6. 
When I union those two nodes, because I'm uniting unioning, uh, their balls, right? Uh, I want to select 9, 3, 3, and 6. Okay? How can I do that efficiently without extracting bits with shifts, comparing and putting back the shifts? So let's say that I'm using 7 bits for counters, and I'm emerging those seven bits into a byte. So I have one bit free, right? So I use this free bit to say that, uh, you know, the counters uh, that have the bit one, the red bit one, are coming from node one, and the counters that have uh, red bit zero are coming from node zero. And I'm uniting those two, right? So what I can do, I can just, uh, somehow do uh, uh, operations on memory words and I can subtract the first, I can do the first minus the second, okay? I, I will do operations byte by byte, okay? Which is fast. So if I do, so the first is actually, uh, if you, if you read it as an integer, as unsigned, will be 137, right? So that's what I get, right? So one, so the first one is uh, one, uh, 28 plus 9 is 137, minus 7, you get 130, right? And that's what you get as a, as a result, right? You get 130. The second one, you have 128 minus 3, so you get 125, right? And so on and so forth. So now, if you get, uh, after this operation, a red bit, which is equal to 1, it means that the winner was the node number 1, right? If you get a uh, red bit equal to zero, it means that the winner was uh, not zero, right? I mean, you're just doing uh, kind of word operations, right? Very easy. Uh, you could take those bits and then uh, do some computations. OK, I take this part of the byte. But you can do think e things even more efficiently. Let's say you take this. And then you write those bits in the space of the seven bits, right? I mean, all these things are used to produce by oring, ending masks, right? Very fast. And uh, next thing, you produce this, which is also very easy to produce. It's a constant. And then you do a subtraction. And what you get, you get this, right? So basically, you get all bits equal to 1 when the maximum comes from 0, right? All the 7 bits equal to 1 when the maximum comes from node 0, and all the 7 bits equal to 0 when the maximum comes from node 1. So if you take this and you end with the uh, uh, word coming from node 0, you get 3 and 6, right? If you take the last bytes and you complement them, you get 127 in the first 7 bits and 0 in the other. And so basically, you get easily by ending those things. So by using this uh, kind of low-level parallelism, you can do these things very fast. So you can compute maximum of those counters very fast, OK? That's kind of uh, low-level algorithmic engineering, if you wish. But uh, it gives you information how to combine this very fast. And this is amazingly fast. Uh, so for instance, there, is a, there was a Hadoop implementation of A and F uh, on a 200k node graph took 30 minutes to compute A and F. 
and uh, upper NF will be just a couple of minutes in a normal work station. So it's much faster than ANF. Uh, the two ingredients which make it much faster are the hyper log log counters and this uh, selecting the max by word programming somehow, low level parallelism. Okay, so let me show you a little bit of experiments. And uh, I'll go very fast because I'm already late. Uh, so it's a machine with uh, 72 gig of RAM and one tera of disk. So they took all these, those snapshots of Facebook and uh, you know, by, by years. And the last snapshot was taken on, in May 2011. It was a big one, like almost uh, 1 billion nodes and uh, 68 billion edges. Uh, they considered the whole Facebook graph, only Italian and Swedish user, only Italian plus Swedish users, or only US users. Uh, and that's what they got. So for instance, for the whole Facebook graph, they computed the uh, average distance, and so you got 4.65. 64 degree of separation. Um, that was the distance distribution for the different graphs. So of course, uh, distances are higher for the whole Facebook graph right? because it's a superset of the other graphs. Uh, but you can see that uh, the other graphs don't, you know, have some kind of uh, similar distance distribution. Uh, that's the average distance. Uh, uh, you can see, you know, so, so it is the uh, Facebook in Italy, SE is in Sweden, uh, ITSE Italy plus Sweden, uh, US, US, and FB all Facebook. Okay, so for instance, you can see that uh, something amazing about Italy. There is always a delay because they, you know, they, been, they had the higher average distance on 2007. And I think Facebook uh, became public in 2006, right? And, uh, but then they catch it up uh, quickly. And actually, they are more friendly than other countries, right? Somehow, the average distance is shorter. Uh, these are sort of parameters of the degree. So the average number of friends is uh, growing. So in the last snapshot was uh, one, uh, 190 friends per account. And that's the diameter. Um, so for instance, the uh, Facebook graph at the time at the diameter of 41. So the two farthest points were 41. Okay, so we're 40 apart. Uh, how they, did they compute the diameter? Um, you can get lower bounds easily by ANF or hyper ANF, but actually they computed the diameter exactly uh, with an algorithm that I was planning to cover, but I'm not sure we'll have time. Um, uh, we'll, after the break, we'll have a a choice, I think. We'll make a choice of the two topics. And uh, it's amazing because it took them uh, only 10 hours to compute the diameter of such a huge graph. And we'll see that the computer diameter is not an easy task at all. Exactly. Okay? Questions? I, I don't hear, sorry. Uh, so for the 2008 graph, they just computed lower bounds for the diameter. And they, um, they computed the diameter. Uh, 
We'll see something. If you want to cover the diameter, you'll see there is a difference between lower bound and uh, real measure. And um, so the first column is just a, an approximation. It's just a lower bound of the diameter. The second is the exact value. The first column was taken from hyper ANF as a byproduct. The second column was uh, another algorithm applied on the graph. Okay, other questions? Okay, so let's take a five minutes break and then we'll make it.